awesome. Hey, thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Now, obviously, we're joined today by uh, industry leading panelists, people who are experts in their craft. They understand everything there is to know about the fencing world, and they're here to just simply share that knowledge publicly with all of you. So, anybody joining today, feel free to take as many notes as possible. All of their contact information will be shared out as well, so you can reach out to anybody one on one to kind of learn a little bit more, more about how they do things and how they look at everything. Um, but just to kind of introduce everybody real quick, just starting, we have Dan, Dan Blonde, who's known in the industry as the Fence King, uh, CEO and founder of, you know, multiple different, uh, like, successful fencing companies like Fence This Yard and things like that. Um, Joe Everest is third generation fencer, known as the Fence Expert, Ozark Fence and Supply. Cannon Johnson uh, owns Jackson Fence. I do like to mess up his name and call him Cannon Jackson by accident from time to time, but I, I get really good at that. Sean, known in the industry as Mr. Fence. I can't take all the time to explain all the things that Sean does, uh, but if you Google Mr. Fence, Mr. Fence Academy, you will see that there is uh, a lot of things that he is an expert in that he could share with all of you. Uh, Matt, founder of um, <laughs> also the founder of My Salesman, who most of you probably use, and if you don't, you probably should look into it. Uh, Pre-qualification tool allows everybody in the industry to have a better time visiting jobs, better experience on site, all that sort of fun stuff. So they'll all be taking time today to really just share some industry insights, expertise, share their value and really share their learnings. Cause a lot of them have learned things the hard way, I'm sure. And they're here to kind of teach you guys a little bit about that. So without further ado, we do have a few, you know, polls, panels, questions, um, things teed up to ask them and run through. But at any time, we do have a chat functionality, so feel free to ask anything in there as well. I'm going to start out with a chat poll, though. So, like, what's the biggest challenge or pain point that you want to solve as a company in 2022? So, for everyone listening at home, just in the chat bot, type that in. Kind of gives us an idea of what you're looking to, to fix and to solve. Um, and then hopefully we can tailor some of these sort of things towards solving some of those problems for you. First question, I want to start out just by asking, so, Sean. Like, what advice would you give a new fence company just starting out? Is there anything specific that someone's reached out to you before, like mentor-mentee relationship and said, hey, like, what do I need to know if I'm just starting a company? I think you said the magic words, right? Research, but go find a mentor. Somebody that's in the industry already, like step one, before you do anything else, is find a mentor of some sort, someone you can trust uh, and rely on. Just bounce some ideas off of, get you on the right path, really, that's all that's for. <clears throat> What about you, Dan? Anything specific that you would give that you'd like to give out as advice? Um, yeah, I mean, feeding off what Sean said, make sure you get the right mentor. Don't do like Defense King did and uh, start off with a name that doesn't work because somebody else owned it and I didn't have any <laughs> idea because the guy that was mentoring me wasn't really the guy that should have been mentoring me and he had me doing things I, the way I shouldn't have been done, doing them. You know, simple things like, I should have been right out the cage, W2 and employees, making people employees. He was teaching me how to get around things. So make sure you get the right mentor because that's just because someone's successful doesn't mean that they're really successful. You know, I've been doing this 23 years and it was 16, 17 years into it before I realized, wait a second, I've been doing this all wrong. And I pretty much had to start my entire business over and set it up differently. Hmm. Any quick tips from anyone else around how to identify that mentor? That's a tough one. Um, I, I'll tell you, as you go through the industry, I don't think you stick with one. I think Sean and I have collaborated on a lot of things and uh, Joe and I've collaborated. Uh, I've learned from everybody that's around me, whether you're in the industry for five years or, or you're a fifth generation, think you, you need to collaborate and uh, we always talk about don't don't do what I do Matter of fact, Sean you and I definitely disagree on some things no we don't <laughs> yes we do <laughs> yes we do so but, but really, mentors is a is not a person necessarily is what I'm trying to say you got some great organizations right American Fence Association Northern American Fence Contractors Association uh, Fence Workers Association, uh, you know, those those associations, those associations at the very least network you with other people that are motivated to be professional in their industry. So like at the very core of those associations, that's where you should be because you will start to do what Matt just said, run into the Joe, run into the Keenan, run into the Fence King, run into those guys and start having multiple conversations with all sorts of guys all over the country and get take 
a little nugget from every one of them, but find out what works best for you. I will never preach and say you got to build a fence business just like Sean King does. And Joe will tell you the same thing. If I was somewhere different in the world with different resources and different ambitions and different goals, my company would look different, even if I was running it. Bingo. Well, and that's the other thing, Sean, you know what you're saying there. When you have your Mr. Fence Academy, and guess what? When you show up there, it's not just Sean. Joe's there. Yeah. Sam's there. Matt's there. Yeah. It's everybody putting in their perspective. And, you know, you, 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 what's the old saying? Eat the fish and spit out the bones, you know? You, you, I haven't you, heard you that. Know? <laughs> and <laughs> so you're like, okay. You know, I used to talk. Grow, growing up, uh, my, my dad used to say he was a cafeteria Catholic. Give me a little bit of that. Oh, I don't want none of that. Give me a little bit of this. And that's kind of and that's kind of like the fence industry is, you know. You know, some guy some guys like wet set, some guys like dry set, some guys like shark hinges, some guys like butterfly hinges. You know, it, it's all what works for you. And it's nice that I can pick up a phone and text Joe and say, hey, Joe, what kind of mic are you using today? I really like that. Hey, Sean, um, how, where are you buying those hinges from? You know, we didn't have that 23 years ago. No, we didn't have that six years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. one, one, yeah, thing right. that, one thing that I'd pitch in on here is that just kind of agreeing with the get a group of advisors sort of thing. So I think Matt put it best. He and I talked about this a while ago. Like you really want to have like a board of advisors of your industry peers, right? So that instead of having one mentor, have a group of five or six, seven mentors because each, each one of us have – gone through life differently, right? Our business journey has looked different. So we've probably, we've probably gone about the same, solving the same problems, different ways. And sometimes the problems are similar, but different still yet. So having a, a board of advisors or a, a group of like-minded individuals might be better than trying to seek out one mentor. Perfect. And then just yeah. to kind of piggyback off that exact thought, when it comes to like problems and things, Joe, what, what are some initial roadblocks you faced? And I know you're third generation, so there was stuff obviously in place, but when it comes to growing and scaling a business and continuing it forward, like what are some roadblocks you initially faced when, when working on that kind of stuff? Yeah. So I think the biggest one that a lot of guys face is access to capital. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have access to capital to, to really push growth. Right. And, uh, there will be some differing opinions on, on that, on whether or not to use debt for growth. But I think when used responsibly and, and in a, you know, in a dedicated way, I think, I think that's, I think it's great. And uh, we've used it to significantly grow our business. Um, I, I but I mean, that's that tough though, Joe. because. Well, Joe, I think what you're trying to say is, it's not always to be debt, debt, capital can be profit. Yes. Right? So yep. profitable businesses are the ones that can grow. Sometimes it's debt, but sometimes it's just making enough profit to grow is where we get stuck sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I think it's what you're that's trying fair. to say. No, that, that's fair. And that's fair. And that's the same kind of pain point, right? It's just not being able to grow because you don't have the means to, right? right. And, you know, when we were we were recently over at City University, Matt hit on this there that, you know, a, a lot of guys, a lot of guys want to grow and a lot of guys have that idea of how they want to grow they just don't have the means to do it right so having access to capital is is absolutely a roadblock now how did we face it we we formed a relationship with our with what is now our banking partner right and just kind of explain to them our business and let them go through the p l's and balance sheet and really feel comfortable with us as a business and with what our plans are moving forward um, I, I think the key thing here is we formed that relationship before we needed it, right? The, the worst, the worst time to find a uh, banker or a lawyer is when you need one, right? She's so, yeah. um, forming that relationship helped us. I mean, we're, we're still, we we're still in a continued growth phase. Gosh, eight years later, 2016 is when, when I had uh, bought this from my dad. So. We're in continued growth because we now have access to capital and because we use it wisely wisely. You know, we don't you gotta be intentional with what you're investing this money in. But that would be that would be a roadblock I think you see a lot of guys starting out face is they just don't have the capital available uh, to grow. Awesome. I really that was awesome insight. I appreciate that. What what about you, Cannon? What about some roadblocks you face, you know, when building? You know, for me it's a little bit a little bit maybe polar opposite of what uh, Joe was saying there. Um, but let me ask you, I got a couple of questions of my own. Are we the dream team? Is that what I see up there? The fencing dream team? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. I'm riding I'm your dream team. 
I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I even got on this dream team. But <laughs> you look thinking the same thing, man. <laughs> You're hey, look, how did I get here? Look, I'm glad I'm here. I'm like, hey, I don't know what we're talking about, but it's the dream team. So, Kitty, uh, he's eye candy. He's eye candy. <laughs> Man, thank you. I just, I'll just sit here and smile. <laughs> Cannon, if, for those of you who don't know Cannon personally, he's probably the most modest person. The first time I ever met him, he's like, I don't know why you're talking to me. I'm just a nobody. But everybody <laughs> knows Cannon. Everybody likes Cannon. Um, he understands the business. His business is successful. Um, so he's, he's here for a reason. I'm, he's not just yeah. some, he likes to act like he's randomly chucked in. But Well, let me ask you this. Uh, <laughs> have you ever done something that you have no idea what you're doing? Either, like, I don't know. Yes. Uh, for some of us, might be going to change a part on a vehicle. You're not a mechanic. You've been there? That's how yep. uh, Jackson Fence Company started. I had never built fence. I had never owned or ran a business. You know? So when you ask Cannon what the roadblock was, like, we can talk. We 30 seconds isn't going to touch anything. <laughs> but I can tell you this. When I say Joe and I were kind of polar opposites on what he's saying, uh, I, I grew up in a in a Dave Ramsey house, okay? Again, never owned a business, never ran a business. Grew up since the age of 15 listening to Dave Ramsey. Debt-free, no credit cards, buy a vehicle that you can pay Ooh. cash for type thing, right? And so for me, it wasn't necessarily access to capital. It was like, how do I do it without having debt, you know? And I think uh, for me, I was, I was kind of born a workhorse. And But, but how do you... How do you be a workhorse, build a business with no debt, and the hardest thing of all, maintain a healthy marriage? That's tough, you know? So uh, that, those are my roadblocks. And I was uh, four and a half years in before I took our first uh, amount of debt, you know, to run our business, you know? And so kind of got the, the brake speed off of me for a few years and uh, uh, partnered up with Sean King and, and, and you know, talked through my business. and 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 put a budget together you know so now that i can kind of understand how to use that health healthy you know and, and and how to track it you know so but that goes back to the first question uh or, or the first the first thing about it is finding a mentor you know so yeah hey, and, I, i'd like to add to that a lot of these questions i'm sure that your mentor can help you help you with obviously yeah. so a lot of these things you know that we're going to cover today can, can also be solved by a mentor this is just a group of like you know five mentors together sharing insight which is really cool so if our, a little more logistical question i guess um so dan how do you deal with things like um um oh actually i jumped my slide out of order there i had one extra question in there so how how long has uh, your company been in business dan uh, we're in our 23rd year. 23rd year? What about you, Cannon? Five years. Five years? And then Joe? Well, you're, Joe, for you, you said since 2016, right? For you personally? Yeah, so I bought it from my dad in 2016. He bought it from his dad in the mid-90s. We were originally founded in 1955. Cool. Got it. And then Matt? Wow. I know my, my salesman and things, two different companies, but just Empire. How long has that been around? Uh, Empire started in 2009. My salesman released in 2011. Okay, cool. And then Sean? I started running this company on my own for my family in 2001. Okay, awesome. So a huge differentiation here of, of timelines too. So that's cool. That was just more for like insight pieces there. Um, and the question that I thought was going to pop up next, uh, Dan, how do you go with uh, on dealing? How do you handle like the ongoing material shortages facing the industry? Any advice for people out there? Because material is tough right now. Well, um, I read a book called The Pumpkin Plan and it completely changed the way I ran my business. I literally read the book and within a week, I was like, all right, we're doing this. And my fiance was like, what? Did you read it or listen to it, Dan? Let's, let's be real. We're not going to go there. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I listened to it. Who reads books anymore? We have That's podcasts, right. right? So yeah, I listened to the book and, um, and it was the perfect time because I listened to it literally just a few months before the uh, pandemic hit where material shortages really started coming into play. And the um, the point of the book was, is do what you do proficiently, take and do that and put everything else to the side. Mm -hmm. Well, in my market, we don't really do chain link. We really don't do vinyl here. You can ride around all day in my market and maybe see 10 vinyl fences, you know, and um, same with chain link. We don't do chain link, which is it's not something that's done in a residential uh, in the residential area. So invite, yeah. So anyway, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to offer this anymore. We're just going to stick to wood and aluminum. 
That's it. Well, when I did that, I realized my working capital doubled or tripled actually, because now I don't have to stock chain link. I don't have to stock vinyl. I don't have to stock, I don't have to stock any of that stuff. And I was able to take, and instead of, you know, if I had a hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, money to buy material with, I could spend 80 of it on lumber instead of 30. So then when that happened, everything just blew up. Then I was able 18 wheel after 18 wheel, just get it in. You got it. I want it. I want it. I want it. And I had all this lumber and all my competitors were sitting at Home Depot waiting for an 18 wheeler to pull up at 530 in the morning going, I want that bundle and that bundle. And I'm over here with more wood than I know what to do with. So that was one of the first things. And the second thing was networking. You know, um, just getting online on Facebook groups and saying, hey, man, where can I find this? Where can I find that? People get in my inbox and, and taking advantage of, of those uh, those situations. You know, I got hooked up with Chris Steele. And before I knew it, uh, Chris Steele with High Steel Fence out of Pace, Florida. Him and I were getting 18 wheel loads of lumber in. And, you know, if I, if I needed pickets, I was calling Sean. And, you know, if I needed cedar, I was calling Texas and, and just being creative, man. You know, I, I kind of got in a little trouble with Master Halco because I ordered pickets from a Master Halco that wasn't in my region, had it delivered to another fence guy, went over there and picked all the pickets up. And they're like, oh, well, you can't do that. I'm like, hey, man, I need boards. Either you're going to do it for me or I'm going to do it. And they're like, all right, we'll do it for you. What about you, Matt? How do you deal with ongoing material shortages? You know, uh, forecasting is a big thing and looking ahead. We know, we. I mean... I'm kind of a freak on forecasting. It's it's something I enjoy doing. So I kind of like trying to predict where we're going to be, what we're going to do. I mean, I, I told our team right now, even uh, not just shortage on, on material, but shortage on labor. When we hit October of this year, I told my team that if we don't uh, add uh, 10 to 12 people, uh, meaning three to four crews, we're, we're going to have a, 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 a major crash in October, and November, because uh, I can see our workload. So not just material, but but predicting people and and pickup trucks. And, you know, how long does it take to get a new truck now? Uh, it takes quite a while. So uh, I'm, I'm ordering some trucks for this fall. And all of that is, I think, really uh, to, to a person that's starting out, you, you've got to really look ahead and say, what, what do we need? And try to be proactive and uh, and not reactive. Um, but sometimes like Dan, I, I'll give Dan credit there. Uh, he didn't let any, he didn't let no stop him, you know, and, and we're not going to do that either. We, you know, you got to do what it takes to get things done. Sometimes you got to think outside the box. I don't know if, if I would have done it the way he did it, but, but that's awesome that he did it. No, that's cool. That's cool. So how, how do you guys kind of um, handle fluctuating material costs? Because obviously shortages are one thing, but the cost of materials nowadays are jumping kind of all over there. So J Joe, how do you handle something like that? Yeah, well, so we stockpile as much material as possible, which I think that's kind of the, the easy answer, right? Is you just, you sell what you have, right? So we, this fall, so fall and winter, obviously in the fencing world are a slower slower time of the year so typically guys will tail off their purchasing uh we actually doubled and in some cases tripled down on what what we would have off what we would have ordered uh we we really stocked up this winter and now we're pretty well stocked for the next probably quarter to maybe quarter and a half and uh so we're selling materials we have on the ground right our costs are now fixed on those materials and we're also ordering six months out so to kind of dovetail in with what matt said uh, with forecasting now, it allows us to order out six, eight months in advance and and ha have a reasonable idea where that material is going to come in at. Uh, but the big thing is selling the materials we have on the ground. Um, you see a lot of guys, uh, they might get sideways because they're basing their prices off what they're what they bought something for today, but they might not be installing they might not be installing it for three to four weeks. So by the time three to four weeks right. comes, well, I mean, we got another treated pine increase this morning. So if we had a job that started Monday based at needed treated pine and we didn't have it on our lot, now all of a sudden we lost 6% of our profit, which mm -hmm. is a significant part of your profit, right? So selling materials we have on the ground uh, really helps us try to take the fluctuation out of our material cost. Yeah. Does anybody on here uh, like buy materials, buy the job as they need it? Does anybody here not have an overhead of materials? Well, you said overhead of materials. I'm going to pipe in there real quick because I don't want to make sure we're correct. 
uh, overhead is not materials. Materials would be a cost of goods. It'll never be associated with overhead. But sorry, to yeah, totally question, just phrase that. So we're clear. Uh, as to your first question, uh, we no longer buy by the job unless it's an anomaly, a custom job. We are right. like Joe just said, and what uh, Dan had said earlier about limiting the options we have available for them. We learned by less is more. We got rid of the uh, brochures from our vendors that had 22 pages and 9,000 colors and designs and styles and heights. And we just went to basic, um, stock those items. And that's what we sell, makes it easier to sell. And what we have sold every day, that has been a game changer for us, getting away from offering everything and ordering every job custom. Hey, I've got, I got so mad that I think it's real important, the tool that, um, that new people coming into the business and people that are already in the business can use. Um, we have a great relationship with a couple of our big box stores. They're constantly trying to get our business and we give them a little bit here and there just to keep them on the line. And every Monday they get an email with a list of our stock items on what we normally would purchase and we get a price. So we, we put those side by side and we can have, so by doing that, we have our pulse on the pricing and we can see that in three weeks, the price has increased this or in three weeks, the price has gone down. It's almost like a, a graph and Dylan and I will be sitting there and Dylan goes, Hey, look, you know, this is going up where we need to start selling at 10% more because when we buy again, this is where it's going to be. And that's what we do. We use our vendors, but we have very good relationships with our vendors. So they don't mind doing it. And I tell them, this is what I'm doing. I'm not doing this just to price you. I'm doing this so I can be successful. And if I'm successful, you're going to be successful because I'm buying from you. So give me these prices every Monday so I can keep my eye on what lumber is doing. And then I can adjust my prices accordingly. And if I'm making money, you're going to make money. And i got three vendors do that every Monday. And we got a file and we literally pull it out. Hey, we need to get our prices changed. Are we going up? Are we Are going down? What are we doing? What do we have in the yard? And that, that's how we do it, man. And it's a real easy way to do it. A simple set up an automatic email to go out to three vendors with the same amount of material every Monday. By Monday afternoon, you have the prices. Tuesday morning, Dylan and I go over it. What are we doing? Are we keeping our prices where they're at or we raise them or we lower them? Awesome. Yeah, no, that, I just know hearing from, you know, customers and such that that's a hot button topic lately is material costs are changing often. So great advice from people learning how to kind of handle that sort of stuff. Um, so are customer demands like and preferences changing a lot nowadays? Like how are they changing? And then like, how do you handle those, Sean? Well, you're saying customer preferences are changing a lot. Um, I think that we're directing that we're driving that we're educating our customers. So how we advertise what we have on display, what we discuss when we go into their house, what we're installing at their neighbor's house. So we're changing the conversation. We have some control over that. Does that make sense? So, um, we do a lot of the advertising, I would say, in our area rather than relying on our vendor. We had a vendor that would co-op and run ads. But the problem with that is it may not be items and things that we want you want to be sharing. So I think we control it up front by um, how we have the conversation, what we advertise, what we put in the ground. Cool. What about you, Joe? Any insight around what you're hearing in the industry from customers? Well, I mean, I think. I think the conversation we were just having about fluctuating prices kind of helps dictate, you know, the customer's preference because the budget only when we're talking about residential customers, the budget only stretches so far, right? And the commercials a, a completely different ball of wax. They can pass costs on, but you know, a home, a home budget is a home budget. So where, you know, two years ago, three years ago, we were pushing only six foot in wood, six foot cedar privacy installed on, uh, purpose-built steel post. So whereas now we have to get a little bit more uh, creative with what we're offering just because that the price of that product has gone up two and a half times in the last three years. So I would almost say cost is dictating a lot of the customer preference and demand uh, and it's putting off a lot of projects. I think there's a thought in the market that prices are going to get better. Um, I, I don't know that that's true. Yeah, I think a lot of us kind of just wait for things like kind of like the housing market in my area. It's through the roof right now. People are like, yeah, I'll just wait. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's going any, anywhere anytime soon. I think it's pretty stuck where it is. So, uh, so how, how are you guys scaling your business in uh, 2022? Matt, any thoughts on, on scaling and growing here? 
I think for for me, I kind of I kind of um, looked at our business and I wanted to go both vertical and horizontal. So I've added a few things. I've added a fab shop. I've added uh, sandblasting and powder coating. Um, so we we kind of specialize in sports construction. Uh, so we've added um, a, a retail arm for sports construction. Uh, that we do some different things, add some different things. I think that, um, for instance, we're a fence company that does netting. I would like to think that we're one of the leaders in the nation in netting. We do a ton of fence, but netting is kind of something we added. And I, now I'm encouraging my friends in the industry, hey, let's add netting to your uh, portfolio. Let us come and help you. Let us teach you. Let us show you what we do. And and it's uh, it's another when, when when this one gets a little bit slow, this one speeds up a little bit. Um, but I think as business owners, you got to be thinking outside the box and, and having some different business. You know, so we have we have a retail arm that sells sporting stuff. We have the fence company, the uh, the netting company, the software company. We've we just adding layers on there to. And I will tell you the, the big thing on scaling. I think when you find good people, you plug them in and you find a spot for them and then you give them the reins and you let them run with it. And, and you don't micromanage, you macromanage, you set the perimeters, you set the boundaries and you say, let's go, baby. Uh, that's, that's, that's the key to scaling your business. Find good people, plug them in, don't micromanage them and let them fail and let them fail fast. I really, that's kind of my new thing lately is I've been telling people, don't be scared to fail, fail fast. Uh, don't sit around. Now that doesn't mean be foolish, but if you're going to scale, you can't sit and think on a decision for six months. Uh, yesterday, we implemented a mentoring program because we had our first company DUI uh, ever in a company vehicle. Now, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, is everybody cringing right now? Everybody- yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, but but instead of instead of getting, I mean, don't get me wrong. I was pissed off. I kicked the chair. I threw a notebook. I I people thought I was going to come through the wall. Uh, by the way, I have a little bit of a temper. But uh, but what I did, though, is I pulled in all 72 of our team members and I said, listen, we're going to start a mentoring program. We're going to break this down to groups of four or five. And we're going to we're going to get better by making you better, by having people that hold you accountable, by getting you to actually talk and share and say, hey, by the way, I'm struggling with alcoholism. Hey, I'm struggling with this. I need a friend to go. on. You want to scale your business? Let your people scale and let your people help you get empower your most precious uh, piece of equipment. And that's the humans. So if you want to scale your business, empower the people and be passionate about taking care of them, pay them up, give them a 401k, give them insurance, give them a pair of boots, take damn good care of your people. If you want to scale your business, how's that? Man, I appreciate that vulnerability there too. You know, that's just a real world example that I'm sure people on here have faced and nobody wants to face, uh, but I'm sure it has happened. What about you, Cannon? What about scaling your business this year? Anything? Specific? I think I'm just gonna follow it up and go join Matt Warner in Nebraska. That sounds really fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can use it. We're, shut, we're shutting down our business. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> just mean, gonna go, awesome. go work. Go work. What about you, Sean? I, I, you always been the uh, cutting edge thinker. So, uh, how are we scaling? Matt is exactly right. We got to scale based on the people we can find. So we've found some uh, creative um, ads to get more people to. Have a conversation with us on uh, coming to work for us. Um, one thing I did uniquely was I put in the ad, I made sure I did not put a position and no pay. So we're looking for anybody that wants to be part of Team Blue, period. And the conversation I get is, well, how much is the pay? I said, well, how much are you worth? You yeah. tell me how much you're worth. You tell me what you're good at. I'll find a home for you. And I've had some great conversations with people so far. Like, are you serious? I'm like, I'm serious. We're growing this way and this way and every which way. And their only their only constraint is not my imagination or funds or re- it is people. So I need people. So I need people in the front end of the office, the back end, the sales, the installation, motivators, cheerleaders. We need all of them. So if you got something you're good at, I really want our team members to find a career that they're happy, less stress. It means you got to find a good at. So rather than hiring people to fit a square hole in their round peg because they applied for it and solid position, but this guy's talented at graphics. I don't know. Cool. I need a graphics guy. We're going to hire you. So people that are motivated, positive, um, we're looking to hire them. And I've had some serious conversations recently about this whole, how much is the position pay? How much is it worth? Well, 
I really believe if a person comes to you and says, I'm worth $18 an hour and your spot was in your mind, 17, 16, whatever, less. I really think you give them the 18. You give them to them immediately. Say, all right, you know what? Fair enough. I'm going to give you $18 an hour. You have the opportunity to prove to me you're worth that. I'm excited. I hope you are. Good luck. And you just empowered them to prove to you that they are right. And they're going to work so much harder than the guy that came in and says, oh, I'll take it for 16. His men mentality right then and there immediately on day one is I'm not getting paid what I'm worth. I'm going to give them 90%. I want the guy to come in and say, damn, dude, give me eight. He didn't even ask a question. Give me what I'm worth. I gotta give him everything and a more. So I got sidetracked there, but my growth is going to come from people. I honestly believe that more locations, more, uh, more training uh, for sure. Um, is what we're looking at. That's awesome. Yeah, we've been doing something similar to that too. Yeah, go. You can go ahead. Yeah, um, you know the guys will come in and say, "I want 18, for example, which is she's 18, and um, I'm like, "Well, I need you to prove yourself." So how about we do this? I'll pay you 16 because that's what the position I was hiring for. But in 90 days, if you're worth that, I'll back pay you that two dollars an hour for 90 days, and you'll have a nice fat check for your savings account, whatever you want to do with it. And the guy's like, okay, deal. So in 90 days, we look at it. I had one guy, it wasn't worth it. I still paid him the money and said, look, we just got to split our ways. You know? So, yeah. you know, three weeks later, he called back saying, hey, man, I, I, I thought about it. I really want to come back to work for you. That was, that in itself was like, wow, okay. We didn't hire him, but, you know. So kind of on the same thing of hiring here, just a piece, a uh, poll that you guys have probably seen pop up is how many estimators your company have today? This is for the audience, obviously. And how many uh, estimators do you want to scale to in 2022? We hear a lot about people trying to grow their sales teams and things of that nature. So just quick hit that poll for us, helps us know kind of who we're talking to and what you guys' skills are. Um, next question is kind of hotly debated that I hear a lot is like, what is your close rate? And do you want to close 100% of your bids? Matt, I'm going to go to you last because I know last time we talked, you got pretty... Uh, you're passionate about this topic. So I'm going to start with Sean on this one. Oh, that made that big good. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, so no, I do not believe your close rate should be a hundred percent, but I believe this is a diluted and a moving target. We have this conversation with people about your close rate, close rate of what, and what do we start with? A lot of guys will close rate and say, I close 50%. 50% of what? Every single opportunity you got or 50% of the ones you thought were good leads? You see what I'm saying? So they let, the whole conversation is convoluted because no one has a set parameter of what is or is not a lead. So with that being said, I will tell you that we track it uh, my, microscopically. We know exactly what it is. And I have a team member here for years has been around 50-51%. What does that mean? That means 50 to 51% of the opportunities that he goes to and gets in front of, he's closing. That does not mean that we're closing 50 to 51% of every single person that calls this office, comes by here, sends us a Facebook message, or emails us. Okay, We vet those down. We do use My Salesman as a great tool for us to vet those guys down. Uh, we use conversation over the phone to vet them down even further so that when we do send that resource out, uh, we're closing at a higher cash ratio. So we're able to do, uh, if you think about it, we have one full-time estimator, one inside office, outside estimated part-time, and myself, I run a couple of leads a month. We're able to do $5 million in sales with that one, two estimators, basically, in gross revenue, right? But we only, and we only allow our estimators to go up to four estimates a day, period. Cannot go to any more than four. Three is our average for the, for the out-in-the-field guy. So... That's my quantifiable data. It's going to be different for everybody because you got to understand where the leads are coming from and what your accountant percentage of. Sure. What about you, Joe? Yeah, we're really in the same boat. So we, we base closes based on quotes we give out. So, and again, this is going to sound almost like I'm mimicking Sean, but we use my salesman to qualify. It's a mandatory first step they have to go through. Now there are exceptions, new homes, stuff like that. Matt, I'll send you an invoice for that plug later. Later. Thank you very much. Um, but no, but so by the time we get, there's a phone conversation involved, and then we send out the proposal. So the, by the time we send the proposal, these people know what it's going. They know the price range is going to come in at. They know our 
our, our rough idea of where we are schedule wise, you know, four to six weeks or whatever it is. So we've already tried to self eliminate the people that don't know what their budget is or that need it next week. And there's just no possible way of getting that done. Right. So 40 to 50 percent is is where we like to see it stay at. Um, I 100 percent is is a very clear indication that something is incredibly wrong in your pricing. Um, it, 100% shouldn't even be close to to correct. Yeah. Now, Matt, I know last time we talked, you gave me a specific number. I don't remember if you remember what it was, but what, what is your thought on the, the whole close rate thing? So first of all, I, I, I want to tell you that the, the people on this, on this panel are forward thinkers and anybody that's listening to this, these are, these are the people that are forward thinkers. And, and, uh, I know a lot of fence people uh, across the nation and I've met a lot of people and I hang out with a lot of really smart and successful fence companies uh, all the way from the Seegers fence on the East coast, which if anybody knows that name, you know that they are one of the more forward thinker uh, thinking fence all the way to fence factory on the, on the West coast um, and including the, uh, the American fences in the Midwest. So I I'm telling you, uh, every single one of them will tell you that if you're over 50%, you're doing something wrong. Uh, that your 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 prices aren't priced right, and that that you can't handle all that work, and you're going to end up having a crash. So rather, you know, I don't want to even put out a number. I mean, we we talked about it, but and we track it very closely. And I know when I get to a certain point, there's an evaluation that needs to be done. And and these people from 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 Canon all the way down to Joe, because we're we're stacked up here. All of them like the idea of pre-qualifying. That, that was the whole idea of our software is I, I got tired and I quickly learned, oh my gosh, one, I don't want to go on this many leads when I was a one-man band. Two, I don't want to land every job because I can't do every single job. I want to land the best jobs that are in our sweet spot revenue wise. And that's how I grew our company. And that, that's what we based this on. That, that, that was the whole idea of my salesman was to solve an industry problem. Yep. Well, so no, I want to add to that real quick, Matt, because I didn't say it, you, brought, you just reminded me of it. So our capture ratio is based off a lot of different things, but what Matt is talking about is backlog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Has a lot to do with capture ratio and net profits or gross margins have a lot to do yes. with it. So our 50, 51% capture ratio for Scott in the field, based on our margin goals, you know, 40, 45% margin goals, 40, 45 on every one of his jobs and our backlog of less than two weeks, right? So if Just my count. backlog was six, eight weeks or 12 weeks, the conversation now is going to be like, why, what, what are we doing? Right. So we got to change that. Um, if my margins aren't high enough, then we would change that. Those, all those pieces have got to be taken into consideration for your company on what your best capture ratio is. Perfect. I agree. <laughs> got it. Got it. So how do you guys stand out from the competition? Like while doing things like that, while avoiding the race to the bottom in price. So we talk about margins, things like that. I know it's easy to just like lower price to close sales and things, but Dan, are there certain things that you do where to help you stand out from the competition while avoiding all of that risk? Yeah, man. Um, we, uh, man, we do a lot. <laughs> and I, I tell you what, prior to meeting all these guys, um, the only thing I was standing out on was my branding, not my quality of work or my fencing. Um, but then when I started meeting these guys and, and started learning things, how do I stand out? We, we offer a lifetime workmanship warranty. And, you know, that's, that's because of Sean King. He, he turned me on to that. Um, and people are like, how do you offer a lifetime workmanship warranty? Well, thanks to the ASA and people like the guys on this panel, we started building since the ASTM standards. So that's how we offer that, that workmanship warranty that's lifetime. Um, so we do things like that to stand out. We, we give our customers an in-writing warranty. We, uh, we do quality fence. And we, we back it up with, you know, the American uh, standards for testing and materials. Sean, what were your, uh, what were kind of your motivations behind leading into like a lifetime workmanship warranty? I know Dan just said you was influenced by you, uh, so I wanted to take that your way. Because everyone sitting here right now on this panel and about every professional I know, if you did something wrong in the field and in installation practice of some sort and that fence failed, every one of you would go fix it. 
right? So if we're going to do that anyways, then let's get something in return and advertise a lifetime workmanship warranty, which just says we will build the fence to ASTM standards and manufacturer specifications, or else we will suffer the consequences of whatever it is to make it right whenever that happens. And typically the error is going to be found within the first couple of years anyways, if you did do something mm -hmm. uh, that is inferior mm -hmm. and it's the right thing to do. Who would want to go take someone's money, put in a shoddy job and not set the post deep enough the fence fell over and be like, Oh yeah, no, the warranty doesn't cover the fact that I didn't dig all the holes deep enough or didn't put them off concrete on there or only use one nail. Like nobody's in it. If you're going to do that, get out of the fence business. Amen. Right. So, yeah, it was pretty easy. I just saw in 2001, I just saw the fact that I would go back every time anyways, and nobody in my area, they were offering one to five year warranties. I'm like, you know what? Psh, watch this lifetime warranty blew my competition out of the water. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and look, I, I met my IT guy this morning at my new office and we were talking about financial advisors and I'm like, yeah, I use Andrew over at Northwestern Mutual. He's like, oh yeah, I got a buddy of mine. I was talking to him yesterday. He's a financial advisor. And he said one of his clients told him that Defense King is his business, biggest competition, that he's chasing him. And I'm like, I don't know why he's chasing me. I wish he'd come over and talk to me so we can get on the same page and be, be at the same level. Because the more of us that are at the same level, then everybody else has got to come up to that level. Say it, Joe. You know? Say it. And, that, and that's hey, like Joe, Sean. Yeah, Rise Sean. That all the ships. Yeah, Absolutely. there you go, Joe. Rising tides raises all the ships. I don't want I don't want my competition chasing me. I want my competition coming over with a cup of coffee going, hey man, how are we gonna raise the bar even higher? Amen. That's awesome. Yeah, so use use each other, lean on your people. I've heard, you know, have good mentors, like do quality work, provide quality warranties. There's all sorts of things that you guys can do to obviously do that kind of stuff. Um, now back on the, the team member piece of the puzzle, how do you guys go about hiring and retaining quality team members, you know, in today's environment? Because it's not easy right now to find the right before people. You go, before you go too far, I'll let Matt turn. The, good job. You use team members, not employee. I am the real right. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. And this, this is all Matt right here. Matt, I'm just going to sit back and let you take this and be inspired. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, first of all, uh, I just told my team, um, you know, yesterday we had that meeting, all 72, 72. I pack, so I have a batting cage business or a, a, a workout facility with a that's turf and we set up tables and chairs. And, and uh, we had this great meeting. When we got done, I pulled my leadership team in, my mentors that I hand selected. Uh, and I said, listen, it's our job to make our team great it's our job to be supporting them they will help us find great people if we take good care of them i have a text message you mind if i read a text message not nah, go for uh, it so, so one of my guys what it says yeah i was gonna say just uh hr appropriate and we're good yeah so <laughs> he says he says this now, this is a guy that quit on me and came back uh he gave me a good notice so he left but he was mad at me left Years late, a couple years later, he came back and he says, Matt, I would like to thank you for the meeting this morning. It was a true eye opener for me and myself. Never in my life did I ever dream of working for a company that cared so much about uh, about your team. I've worked for some real buttholes in my life. He, he used a different word there. Um, uh, if you, uh, He says, if you've ever got time to sit down and chat, sounds like we have a lot of things in common with breaking loose from bad influences. And I, I need to do the same. Thank you again uh, for giving me the lifetime of an opportunity. So here's the thing is I think that you want to hire good people in today's environment. Take really good care of them. Yeah. And tell them that I told them about my best friend when I was in my 20s, that all we did was went and shot pool and drank beer. I had to get away from my absolute best friend. I had to break that that relationship because if you show me your five closest friends, I'll show you a glimpse of your future. So I've been telling people, we don't have any problem hiring. Matter of fact, I'm in trouble because we got people coming in. I got two more superintendent type uh, mentalities that are working in highway construction and the other ones on house construction that want to come and work here because they have been hearing from our people about what kind of environment we have. You want to hire good people? Provide a great environment. That doesn't mean be a wussy. 
That doesn't mean to cave. That doesn't mean uh, to, to let a whole bunch of stuff go. When we got that DUI, I threw a, ta- a chair across the room and I man, and my notebook was in pieces and I had papers everywhere because I was like, doggone it, that's not going to happen again on my watch. I care too much about these people. And I don't give a damn if our insurance goes up and all that. I'd give a damn. I don't want everybody to lose a life. Right? Tell us how you feel about it, Matt. You're right. Yeah, tell I us how you feel. I feel like that was the sense. I just want to say, I just want to go on the record and say, uh, Matt was talking about your five best friends. And I just want to say, I'm right here with my five of my best friends. So. <laughs> just, that's funny you say that, man. I was thinking the same easy. thing. I'm like, I'm going to hear count. Can... One, two, three. Yeah, that's five right there. <laughs> <laughs> I can text Matt on a Sunday afternoon and say, hey, man, tell me about Dunn, Dunn and Bradstreet numbers or text, you know, any of these guys anytime and get, a, and get a text back. And those are the guys I'm reaching out to. But that's why Matt is the culture guy. Ken and I were talking about that the other day. We're just going to start calling oh, Matt no. the culture guy. The Thank culture you. guy. I'll take that. And the, and, and the binding. He also knows a little bit about binding. That's, that's a passion point. Yes, yeah. As well. <laughs> hey, but you know what, though, Ken, and, you know, you and I, we – I showed you one of my trade secrets that I've never showed anybody because I'm embarrassed because I didn't know if it really worked. I just made it up. And you sent me the nicest email back. Hey, check this out. I'm actually communicating in my company with, with uh, you know, I don't want to go into details on all of it, but it it works to have good people to surround yourself with, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Look, I, yeah. I, have a whole, I have a whole Saturday routine because of Matt Warner. And, 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 and <laughs> one of my most closest team members here has a Friday routine because of Matt Warner, you know, and we love it. Yeah. I need to find, Oh, I know what that routine is. All right. Yeah. I told That's a few awesome people, stuff. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you've got a single Matt taught me to do and it's freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Matt just, does yoga and he does the Daniel LaRusso crane every morning. <laughs> That's his routine. There it is. <laughs> Love oh, that guy. No, but you guys, you guys have a little too much fun together. I can see it's awesome though. I love it. Uh, I skipped past one slide, just in the interest of time, because we got about fifteen minutes ish left, and I don't want to, uh, you know, monopolize all your guys' day. I appreciate you taking the time that you're taking to provide all this insight and stuff. But I wanted to touch on this because it's been a, a thing that I've been hearing a lot about. Um, and uh, Dan, you talked about it earlier, so I'll let you kick it off. But do you offer financing? Obviously, we know you do. Um, and do you recommend it, and why? Like, what, what has financing done for you? Oh man, um, I mean it, it. It it takes customers that um, I don't want to say they're broke. I just want to say customers who maybe they're not disciplined in saving and you know and so forth, but they're disciplined in paying bills. I, I mean, expenses now they're, they're getting out of control, man. You know, um, Dylan was bragging the other day about some fences he sold, and I'm like, hold on, man, I was selling fences, you know. Nine dollars a foot. Now it's forty-four. Okay, so you can't say you're selling bigger jobs than I sold. Let's look at the footage, not the total cost of the job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to trying to hold on to it a little bit because he's he's young and bucking and you know strutting around. But anyway, um, yeah, financing man, it, it's 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 awesome. You know, I go into Best Buy and I go look at a TV and I got to ask somebody what the price is because it doesn't have the price. It's just telling me how much it's going to be a month. Like, you know what? I need to do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm tempted not to tell the people how much the thing is. Just say, hey, for 15 years, you're going to pay $235. You want the fence or not? You know, um, we can't do that, obviously, but that's what Best Buy is doing. So I, I'm uh, financing is, is great. And at one time, I had a different finance company. I'm not going to bring those people up. And I, I was really all for them until I found this, this new company. But on all my trucks, it says, finance with my fence. We finance. And I get more people call me because we finance and don't use the finance and get the fence that I had my CPA take the money it was costing me yearly for that service and put it in my marketing budget because it got me more jobs and I wasn't even using it. Hmm. So just by offering financing and no one else is, you know? Um, it, it just changes everything and it gives people hope. Hey, I don't have any money, but you know what? I can call the fence king because he's got financing. And if I don't get financed, it's not his fault. It's my fault. 
Yeah. And go to, uh, if you guys are curious to see that in action, Dan does a lot of work with pre-qualifying people right on the website too. You can literally apply for finance and get pre-qualified instantly just to know. So allows them to kind of, yeah. along with my salesman, qualifying the actual job cost and leads that makes or the customer can afford it as well. So it's a very, yeah, so very strategic Matt, way I, of doing it. Matt, can I bring up that financing thing that I'm doing with you? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Hey, well, first of all, can I say this? We, we do not offer financing. We tried it uh, and we just didn't think that it worked for us. Now, I will tell you, Dan, Dan, did I not give you a huge compliment the other day and said, you're a forward thinker, man. You're you. Mm -hmm. I like your, your thought process. We will never offer financing. We just won't. It just doesn't fit our area and our market. Uh, Lincoln and Omaha, Nebraska, people just don't finance fences. I we, we offered it uh, three, four years ago. Um, we're having great success not doing it. So, so by the way, I, I mean, I just want to go on record as saying that we don't do that, but I love what Dan's doing. Dan's trying to help out people that are in a pinch. Um, I'm just, it's just not, it, it doesn't work for us. And once again, we said, don't do everything everybody does. Do what works for you. Well, in my region, um, I live in Mandeville, Louisiana. And at one point we had more millionaires per capita in Mandeville than Hollywood had. So everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses. Financing is how it's done. Mm. You know, we, I go in these houses. I, when I used to go out on estimates, I don't go anymore. Um, we go to $800,000 home, walk in, and they got sheets on the windows, and some of the bedrooms have mattresses and box springs on the floor, but they got the big house. Mm. So our region, everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses, and how do they do that? Charge, 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 finance, finance, finance. So you know what? I'm taking advantage of it. So yeah. uh, Matt, my salesman, uh, which great thing. I completely run my entire business off of that now, kind of like Joe does. Um, Joe, you run everybody through my salesman, right? Yeah, we do the and same thing. We time. literally, you call us, we take your information, and we send you a link to go to, the, go to our my salesman, which we call it our virtual fence designer. Um, but Matt has a little piece of real estate on there at the bottom left on the My Salesman where you can do some advertising. He played with it a little bit and I called up Rachel and was like, hey, Rachel, um, I want that space. Well, Matt doesn't know what he's gonna do with it. I'm like, I need it. So she went ahead and said, all right, I'll let you experiment with it. Got with my uh, marketing guy, Benji, over at uh, cleverfox.online and was like, hey, Benji, I want a financing link there. I want a hyperlink in it. And I want people to get their price from my salesman and get pre-qualified for a loan before I even talk to them. So I called up Matt this past weekend, like excited, like, Matt, Matt, it's working. It's working. He's like, what? I said, man, I got people in my inbox that aren't in my CRM yet, which means I've never spoken to them. They're, they got their, they got, they know what their fence is. We know exactly what type of fence they want. They have a budget and they're already pre-qualified. Monday morning when my assistant comes in, she's going to start reaching out to them and get them going through the process and getting them financed. I said, it's working, man. It's working. And Matt was like, I love it. I love it. So I'm hoping Matt's going to start releasing that real estate area for some other people to utilize it for advertising specials or postmasters or whatever, financing. But literally, and it's a gift. It blinks. And the whole time you're doing your fence, it says, finance my fence. You just got to click here. It's 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 amazing. It's coming. But it's all it's all marketing. Yeah. You know, people say I have finance and nobody uses it. Well, do you tell people you have it? I mean, kind of. Well. Hey, hey, Cannon. Where where have you seen the most success promoting your business, promoting Jackson Fence? <clears throat> Gotta be everywhere. Uh, that's your name on the side of your truck. That's that's for me. Everything I wear is branded. Like when I go places. And for me, this is silly, uh, kind of, maybe not. I want to look the same all the time. I don't like making this. Just like Joe, Joe, what's your color you're going to wear tomorrow? Orange, right? 100% chance. Dumb it down. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you walk into Joe's closet, it's probably orange shirt, orange shirt, orange shirt, orange shirt, orange shirt. He looks the same every day. I like to think I look the same every day. You know, I do a lot of videos on on. on I'm on TikTok now. I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe like a little girl, but I like TikTok. <laughs> you know, I got a lot of haters there, and I like going on there. And I've learned 
that people who recognize you begin to trust you and, and to identify you with a, with a brand, you know? And so this sounds silly, but I like to wear my blue hat, my blue shirt, my gray jacket, and my yellow gloves. <laughs> like I did a lot of videos on accident with these yellow gloves on. Now these yellow gloves are part of me, you know? And I always keep them with me in case I want to do a TikTok video. But branding, be everywhere. So, so social media, uh, that's, you know, not to sound like Gary Vee, but that's by far the highest uh, value in marketing, you know? Put a couple hundred dollars on on, on Facebook. Put a thousand dollars on on Google Ads. Be at the top of the list. Be the first person that calls. Uh, everything we talked about. What your clothes right need to be. Uh, what are the obstacles? You overcome most of that stuff by making your phone ring and, and, and getting forms filled out and, and, and dropping your inbox and getting people over to your my sales and portal. So uh, advertise, advertise, advertise. Be everywhere, everywhere you can be. Uh, Sean King, he's king of truck wraps. Uh, he says it the best. You can go out and buy a billboard and it might be $2,000 a month. You can spend a couple thousand dollars on wrapping a truck and it's with you forever. And everywhere you go, it goes with you, you know? So, uh, not to ramble. Yeah, I don't, like don't want to be a damn block over here. I'm going to cut my, I know what 30 seconds is. <laughs> I get excited, man. I'm sorry. Oh, we know. We know. So what about you, Sean? How do you how are you promoting Mr. Fence? Mr. Fence is kind of everywhere, but how do you see the most success promoting it? Uh, consistently branding like a fanatic, right? So uh, anywhere and everywhere to find opportunities to brand. I like to use the word branding, not advertisement. I don't buy billboards. I don't do radio. I don't do TV. I don't do print ads. I don't do any of that stuff. I love when they call me because they come to get done trying to sell me something. They're like, uh, I won't call you again, but it's, I, I find it better off spending money. We, we embroider our guys' pants everywhere they go. Their pants say Mr. Fence, their shirts, their hats, their gloves, every truck is wrapped. We're, we're sponsoring, uh, you know, local rodeo and the, the charity events and give back events and the home association. Like that's where the money should be spent on helping help somebody else, uh, continuously looking for the opportunity. Yesterday we had, a. Um, a not-for-profit call us because someone had destroyed a gate of theirs. I dropped everything I was doing. I personally drove there, took the gate, replaced the gate, put the new one back up within three hours until my last day. I didn't charge my penny. What did I get for that? They threw it on social media, like superhero hero, Mr. Fence. One phone call replaced the entire grand vinyl gate and our daycare is now secure again for kids. Like you can't buy yeah. that billboard. That's yeah. what it cost me. It cost me, an hour and 50 bucks in parts. I don't know, hundred bucks in parts, 200. It doesn't matter what it cost me. It was insignificant, but constantly finding opportunities to make yourself different for us. It's blue. You know, uh, everything we do is blue. And I think that helps color branding as well. But uh, so your question is, what do we do to be different? Everything, how we talk to customers and everything. Just try to think of the box. For the people at home, just to talk about the, he used the word fanatic earlier. Um, we had like a little Google sheet ahead of this where we were communicating around, you know, some of the topics. And he was like, even everything he typed had to be blue. Cause like uh, Dan, had, Dan had used blue and Sean was like, I'm also blue. So yeah, like, it will be blue. <laughs> it will be blue, no matter what, even if it's internal communication, it's blue. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, is it surprising to you guys that almost half of homeowners have had a bad experience with a contractor? And what steps have you done to uh, gain that back? I will have to keep this one a little short just because we're running tight on time. So just like a real quick snippet of maybe a quick story of how you guys have gained trust back from somebody who maybe was a little skeptical of a contractor. Well, so unfortunately in our market, we've had a couple companies in the last five or six years um, do the deal of taking deposits and, and not performing on the work. Um, they perform work for a little while and, until they had enough to, you know, enough money in the bank and then they skip town. Uh, so what we like to do in that case is, is kind of partner up with, so typically there's a, you know, typically the news agencies are involved in this and, uh, you know, highlighting this story. So we'll partner with them, uh, pick out one or two cases of people that really got taken advantage of and try to pitch in and help out. Um, most recently there was a, there was a lady that had been taken advantage of and, uh, so this is, uh, so Sean likes to talk about win-wins. Uh, we had a we had some aluminum left over from a job. The job was bid and accepted at, at significantly larger than what we installed at. So we had we had aluminum sitting on the lot. Well, this lady uh, she, she had she had a she had a really you know a, a heartstring story 
So we went out and we built a fence for her for free. She gave this guy all the money she had, and that's not an exaggeration. Like it was all the money she had because her dog was important to her, and uh, she was in a situation where her dog was kind of in danger as it's let out of the house. So anyway, um, we like to be the ones to come out and and try to make that right, right? And that's kind of the talking point. Is listen, I I feel responsible for our local fencing industry, right? And the fencing industry in general, because of one bad egg now has a certain look in our community. So I feel responsible to try to come out and make that right. Um, you know, it's, I don't know it, that, that kind of toes the line on self-promotion though, too. So you got to kind of be careful with that. But, uh, I think when you approach it correctly from the, from the standpoint of, we want to be the people that help so that our local industry isn't seen as right. that type of contractor. Yeah. And it comes down to I know what Sean was talking about in the previous thing, branding too, you know, customers yeah. are going to be a lot more confident and comfortable with the people, the names that they see that they know are reputable and reviews. And Canon talked about spending money on Google and like, you know, Google reviews and things. I'm sure you guys all focus on nowadays, very important to get out in front of customers, things of that nature too. Um, so let's jump ahead to when you guys are a little more on site, So like, what does your quoting process look like? Like Joe, when you hit a site, um, what, what steps are taken out there? I know you do pre-qualification, so we can yeah, start. Yeah, we don't actually, we're not actually on site until the, the job is awarded. We have a contract and a deposit um, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10. Um, so there are instances, typically it's new home builds that simply don't show up on satellite imagery uh, that we do go out. Our quote process starts with my salesman. Uh, it is a mandatory first step. That leads to a consultation phone call where we review the, the my salesman information. We also review... Uh, county assessor's website just to just to confer that or concur that uh, what they submitted as their property lines actually jive up with the county assessor's uh, map of where those property lines are uh, we'd shoot them a proposal based on those two pieces of data and then uh, they can either accept or decline uh, once they accept they're given or they're sent an uh, e-document that where they can e-sign it uh, similar to you know the the main uh, doc, each e e signing document providers out there, uh, and they get a invoice for the deposit. Once both those are are submitted and received, then we'll send them a scheduling link to come out and actually do the final measurement. Which here's the thing is, and this is why I tell people. So the the pushback here is, so you're telling me that you can just not come out and know how how many feet of fence I have. I said, listen, that is that is the day and age we're living in. And it's crazy that a satellite flying hundreds of miles an hour in outer space can take a picture and it's accurate within two foot of your project. And we, right. we verified that, you know, we verified that with previous year's sales data is how often were they off and how much were they off? Typically, it's within two foot. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with that. Anybody here go on site for every quote? I'm sorry, what's that? Does ever anybody here go on site for every quote? Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, we do. We don't go through until they go all the way through the my salesman process. We don't, <clears throat> and we don't. We will not. Will not come see you until we have a drawing and you have a budget in front of you. Um, we don't even look at the drop off report. Dan looks at the drop off report, but we're just so busy, we just don't do it. Well, in our in our fuel budget, thanks us right now for that. Yes. Hey man, we charge for all our estimates. So, but there's a process. They go through to my salesman. Hey, is this in your budget? Yes. Then we go ahead and do like Joe does. Call them up. Hey, I see this is what you did. We're looking at it with a different type of software. We see you're a little off here. Make the adjustment. Is this still in your budget? Yes. Okay. It's 50 bucks for us to come out and verify those measurements in the job site. And people are paying it. Some people are like, well, no one else is charging. All right. No one else is giving a Lifetime workmanship warranty, you know? Yeah. No now, for those of you who do go on site for every job, how uh, how quickly are you turning around those quotes? Well, so, Sean, I put, if someone, so, Cannon, if someone calls Jackson Fenn and says, hey, I want a quote, and you go out to give a quote, you know? And that's I mean, and that's going to use my salesman or not, but I'm just curious, like, how long until the, they get their final number? Yeah, so, so, so first of all, that's going to depend on um, – time of the year, you know, we are, our, our, our backlog of jobs we need to go look at changes throughout the year. Right now it's pretty substantial I and mean, it's springtime, you know? Uh, however, everybody has the option of using uh, my salesman, you know, 
everybody also is given an option of, of taking a phone consultation. You know, uh, we have tried to make both mandatory. Uh, I don't know if our pricing is, is just, you know, a different structure. I, I don't know, you know, but I feel like what, what happens here is we jeopardize a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity by not meeting people, you know. Now, we do use tools to pre-qualify uh, and, and, and weed these things out, you know. But we also budget in, uh, you know, fuel costs and, and time and, and all these things. It's part of the job. And, you know, I, to me, I feel like we offer a lot more than, than being the leading uh, price point in fencing. So, to me, it's important that we get out there and we communicate the different values that we're going to bring to your yard uh, and close the deal that way. But once we're there, usually uh, that evening, they got a quote, you know, so that's how we do it. Well, my quoting process is all about to change tremendously. And that's because of you guys, which way are you that way? Well, we're implementing our site. So we, uh, that, that's all going to change, man. Our turnaround is going to be lightning fast because of yeah. that, and that's because of my salesman and our site. Yeah. You know? And how do, so, so for you, those of you at home, quick poll pop up on your screen. Uh, how do you produce estimates today? And this is just looking for answers of you know pen and paper, digital, etc. Just real curious to kind of get a, a poll of how how the industry is still doing it. We know things are changing rapidly, but real curious to kind of see uh, how that works. Now we have just a couple minutes left. I do want to try to get to a couple more of these questions, but I'll probably skip a few here in just a second, just to in the interest of time. Um, so just real quick, this just doesn't have to be a long or lengthy explanation of how you use it. Just purely curious, what automation or technology are people here using to improve their business? And this can just be list form. I mean, my salesman has been talked about by everybody, um, so we can start there. But you know, Dan, what else is big for you? Oh man, uh, simply. Um... I think it's Simply Fusion. It's the name of their the yep. real name of their company. They're out of Utah. VOIP service, right? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a, yep. it's a VOIP voice over uh, internet protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, it integrates with Job Nimbus, which is our CRM, and every phone call is recorded and stored under the activity of the customer. Mm -hmm. um, every text message. Um, it's 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 a great tool. Uh, company Cam integrates with Job Nimbus. So my guys are out taking pictures and they're dropping underneath the activity. And then uh, Job Nimbus also has email automation and we couple that with uh, Simply. And we make web hooks in Simply, which are basically just text messages. And our customers are getting an email and a text. All these automations are going like crazy. I could talk about that all day, but we, we have a lot, a lot of automations in our company and Canon and I will be on the phone eight o'clock at night and people are responding to automations and I'm like, dude, we're selling jobs and it's Sunday because of automation. So. Sure. Cool. Um, and then I know, I know just from what I know, I know three of you guys use job Nimbus. One of you uses true Matt, what do you use for your CRM? Well, we use, um, well, I mean, we, we don't really use a CRM. I am in between, mm -hmm. uh, using a couple different options. Uh, I'm testing uh, Contractor Accelerator. I'm testing Builder Trend. I'm testing True. We are really uh, almost a little bit confused on which one we want, and we're struggling with it. Um, and I think that all goes back to just for the audience at home, just test stuff out. Find what's right for you. There's not a perfect solution for anybody, whether that's drawing tools or CRMs or estimating softwares or company cam or any of that like it might be right for some people not right for everybody work with your mentor and things like that to kind of really dig that out um one thing i want to jump ahead to just because i think this question is really important we uh, kind of covered this a little bit earlier um what do you guys think the future of the fencing industry is just quick you know 30 seconds to a minute from each of you guys i'll go first i i really think um I think I, I think we were right. We've been riding on quite a few years of, of really good times. And, you know, I started in 2009 and it was really tough. Um, I, I really think that if you're. <clears throat> I'm going to be a little bit careful what I say here, but if you're not um, working on your business, you you are probably going to get in trouble 
in this recession that I'm, I'm predicting to happen within the next uh, eight to 14 months. And it's going to be tough. Uh, right now, the economy itself, and I hope that all good business people are watching the economy, uh, paying attention to what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of money out there right now. But when, when, when this thing slows down a little bit, I, I really think that you need to be a good entrepreneur. You need to be smart in your spending. You need to be, uh, pay attention to uh, your, your, your pennies because they, they ultimately breed into dollars. So I really think that you've got to watch that and you've got to be efficient and, and, and the good companies are going to prevail. I hate to say this, but I think that, the, that right now, I, uh, there's six brand new companies this year, brand new fence companies in Lincoln, Nebraska, a town of 300,000 people, six. I think right now the economy's good. People are still buying. When that slows down, I'm begging my friends in the industry, pay attention to what you're doing and be smart. How about that? <clears throat> like it. I, I would echo that. I think I think we're we're what twelve years, fourteen years into a really good economy. I mean, just you know, and, and that's not a political statement, that's just kind of reality of just growth and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of contractors out there that their entire growth cycle has been within a strong economy and i you know I, I think i think there's tough times ahead in that you know for guys that have seen it and been through it and just know kind of what that looks like it, it won't it'll hurt but it won't hurt as much but i think we're going to see unfortunately we're going to see a lot of contractors that that rely on cash flow only uh get in really tough spots and just because they don't they haven't experienced uh you know, lean economies. Yeah, we're definitely in a bubble, man. I remember, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, if it was an election year, business was slow, but it hasn't been like that. It doesn't matter. If there's an election going on, a war going on. It doesn't matter. People are spending and it's, it's odd. And there's going to be guys who haven't been through it. Like I've been through it. Matt, I, I mean, I don't know how much y'all have been through it, but you know, being doing this since 99, and being the business owner going through that that's that's an eye opener you better have your ducks in a row you better know Amen. what you're doing go ahead John. me uh matt why do you say eight to 12 months man that might be a different conversation let's not go there uh, <laughs> it is it is a deep conversation and if you guys if you guys want i mean actually text me up I'll, I'll tell you why i think there's some trends that i've been watching and um, and it, it's going to happen. Uh, one is because I'm, I'm watching the oil market. Um, two, there, it's an election year. Three, I mean, there's some th some signs. And I think, I think that, listen, guys, fence is our tool. We're entrepreneurs and we're taking care of people. And you have an obligation to be really smart with your company so your people can uh, take care of themselves. It's You have this huge responsibility. Fencing is our tool. Yep. The people is what we're doing. We're, we're here to take care of. And when you figure that out, you're going to start, you're going to start watch this. But I really think that this is coming. And, and you know what? The beautiful thing is, is that if you're really smart with your money, you're going to be doing good. The, the defense industry might dive off just a little bit, but you're going to be strong and be smart in what you're doing because you're smart, you're efficient, you're paying attention, but it's going to come right back. It always does. So, um, so be careful. I, I'm, I'm not, this is not doom and gloom, by the way, folks, this is an opportunity, right? And every once in a while, you have to call the herd. I feel like Sorry. my Dave Ramsey years are going to pay off. Yeah, <laughs> it is, man. And, and Matt's right. It's going to, it's going to call, you know, we get these, we get these hurricanes down here and all these fence guys start up and within a few years, they're, they're all gone. You know, they, they, they get called out and that's exactly what happened during the, uh, the what was it? The construction market crash in what? Oh, seven, oh, eight. I forget what year it was. Oh, wait, the house market. Morning, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, was, King, you didn't know yet, did you? The people who have relation, the people who have relationships with their vendors, and the people who have relationships with local contractors were the people that are still here today. Yeah, you know, there's one guy left from 2005. One guy left from 2005 that wasn't in business. And that is still in business now. One, and we had sense companies everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not. I'm talking about the pack that just keeps moving. You know, that pack gets big and then it gets called down. There was one guy that stuck around uh, when that pack grew big. Yeah, one guy. 
Sean, what do you think? Uh, or if you're trying to sum up the future of the fencing industry, not that that's an easy thing to do, but just overall thoughts there. Listen, future of the industry. I'm freaking excited. I'm telling you what, there's some great <laughs> things coming. I can listen to all this stuff. I'm like, wait a minute, guys, I have the wrong idea. There's more knowledge and resources being shared right now that I've ever seen in the 34 years I've been around this industry. There is more resources and tools available for the fence community right now than there has ever been. There is such an opportunity for us to grow, even in a bad economy, we're paying attention. The numbers better than we ever have. We're buying better than we ever have. We're building fence better than we ever have. We're having a conversation about being professional better than we have ever done. And so what I think is going to happen is the strong are going to get stronger and the weak are going to get weaker. It's just like wintertime kills all the plants. We start back over. I'm telling you, the harsh ones, the strong are, will survive. And it's going to clean house of all these little guys that probably weren't dead. I say little guys being not dedicated is what I mean by that. Not yeah. true entrepreneurs dedicated to the craft. They just are taking the opportunity that there's so much work out there right now that they can haphazardly slip on top of jobs, get captured a job and go make a little bit of money. But when it gets real, when things start to constrict, those of us that are very focused on the entrepreneurialistic business are going to flourish because the other guys are going to just starve because they're too lazy to dedicate on running their business. They're too busy working in their business. Does that make sense? I'm freaking excited. Yeah. This, ha this has happened to multiple times and I'm more ready now than I've ever been in my life to go through. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. I really appreciate you guys sharing that too. And I was watching uh, a YouTube live of my fence life just a couple days ago. And one of the guys, their guest of the day um, was David Gatto, guy Future Solutions Fence. True bootstrap story. The dude had zero dollars, knocked door to door to create a business, and now he's flourishing. He, he said systems and processes equal freedom. So I'm stealing a quote from him in that, yeah. in that thing. And he talked a lot about like really just getting finite and really specific with putting a structure in place allows him to, you know, take all these extra luxuries and things when it comes to being prepared for stuff and not having a single thing derail anything, you know? So if you guys are listening today and you don't have any systems processes in place and you're purely just riding a wave, wave comes down and there's not going to be much left. So take the advice of the guys here, super important. Make sure that you're really investing in the business, you know, focus on things like your processes, your systems, your, your sales strategy, your marketing budgets, your branding, all that sort of stuff really plays into the success of, of a company. Um, and last chat poll, this is one, just type into the chat. Nothing's going to pop up. Just what topics do you want us to cover in future webinars? You know, we love hosting this kind of content. It's important. Like we're not a fence company, but we love to understand the industry better. And at the end of the day, if we can get people together and share this kind of knowledge in kind of a confined forum, I think it does wonders for everybody involved. So just anything you can think you want us to cover. Um, and then we also have our homeowner survey report and things like that, that we have built out. Um, if you want the free contractor checklist or any of our homeowner survey report data that we had put together, that's the thing Joe and I covered on the last podcast or last webinar, sorry, we talked a lot about just homeowner survey data and how people hire and buy contractors. So I can't thank you guys enough for your time. We're definitely over our time limit. So I appreciate you guys sticking with, but conversation was too good at most parts to cut you guys off. So I highly appreciate it. And then I uh, hope to talk to you guys all again soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah. You right. thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Bye. Bye.